Welcome to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. This is Chris Miller. I invite you to join me as I interview artists from a variety of disciplines. We'll share powerful stories and lessons learned while making their art. Good day. This is the Spiritual Artist Podcast, and you are with Chris Miller. I am excited for today's guest, mainly because I've known her for such a long time, and she's a real sweetie. What got me to this point is the, my exploration of body and mind. And I started thinking about my mind, and a spiritual artist knows that your mind is not who you are. We are that quiet space behind the mind, the silent watcher, as Eckhart Tolle would say. We watch our mind and we can direct it. So the mind really, it's a tool. It's a tool, just like anything else you might use. It's just like a book or a computer or a calculator. It's a tool. Can we control that tool? Can we make it work better for us? Can our mind be managed, so to speak? And that's what leads me to educational consultant, Lisa Watford. She is a wonderful teacher. Years ago, my son has ADHD. And if you haven't caught on by now, I have it also. And we sought Lisa out for help with his learning differences. And so we scheduled an appointment to see her and we went out and visited her studio. And I'm gonna tell you that story in a minute, but let me just give you a little bit of background with her. Lisa has trained with students to help them adapt their natural gifts and enable them to excel at any task, any task at hand, whether it's doing homework, studying, communicating with others. Her academic coaching skills have been honed by years of working with learned learning differences. Is that right? Learning difference students. Lisa's shaking her head. Yes. And she wants to share those tools. And I think they're a great tool because I think we all could use these tools in today's world where our cell phones are beeping, where our computer is chiming, where our car is talking back to us. Oh my gosh. How do we, how do we manage this mind? So I would like to introduce you to Lisa. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Chris. I am so I'm thrilled to have you here on the show. I wanted to I want to share with my viewers my first experience with Lisa. Okay, so we scheduled an appointment with our son. I, I he was very young, maybe five. I'm not sure. And we came out to your your uh, office, and I remember you said, "I want to meet you outside." And I, I okay, I was like, "Okay, we'll meet you outside." And so it's you know office park building, and it's beautiful tree lot it sat on. And Lisa comes out the door, and we bring Blake up, and she walks out to Blake, and she leads him over to a tree. Do you remember this? Oh, I do. (laughs) She leads him over to a tree and she has him hug the tree, hug the tree. And I was like, what? This is it. This is new. This is new. So Lisa, tell me, what was that about? Why remind me of what that was for Blake? I was helping him to ground because you thought he had ADD or ADHD at that time. And being with the earth, being with the tree, actually calms a child down or an adult if you're really stressed go put your back up to a tree and just let it support you because it's substantial Uh it's literally got your back and it just relaxes the body and so that probably saved us 15 minutes of time in my office because he was already in a good place before we started and and sometimes if you just go and put your hands on a tree yeah. You know, or once again, the back or the hugging. How do you feel afterwards? Right. You feel grounded. Yeah. You cannot feel the same way. And children have so much information to be bombarded with so much information. It just gives them a moment to like, oh, and I know you guys thought I was nuts <laughs> and especially your son. But I saw in his eyes and I saw across his eyebrows that he relaxed. And that's the face, the body will tell you everything. So Lisa, I, I love that story. I, I was, and I'm a big tree hugger. I mean, by, by my very nature. So when I saw that, of course it was, you know, instant infatuation. I was like, this is interesting. This is a woman that, that takes, takes this education very seriously and takes it to a level that a lot of people don't. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because if you can do other things instead of medicating, yeah. You know, if there are things that they can do organically, <laughs> if you can, if you can do things that are natural uh-huh. and they don't need medication, they feel much more in control. And a lot of things we can do 
I call it um, meditation instead of medication. Oh, wonderful. You know, and that's what the tree is. Just give them a minute. And, and sometimes kids will go out and give a laundry list to the tree. And I'm like, okay, need pen and paper? What, what, what do we need to do here? It's just whatever they can do to feel more grounded and balanced. And if you'll take five minutes and do something before studying or before focusing on any activity, it'll probably save you 20 to 30% of the time. You'll do it that much faster because you've gone from way out here somewhere and you're coming in and you're learning to hyper-focus on only what you want. And that little five minutes of that opportunity, just like in your book, Mm -hmm. those exercises are pure genius, purely life-changing because it's focusing on what you want instead of what you don't want. And sometimes you don't know what you want. You think you know what you want, but you do that activity and you get led somewhere else. It's even better. You know, it's funny. I I, I agree with that. I, I, I think I do go over that bit in the book, but I think that's important for us to just get into that space. You know, we talk about that, that space of receiving and that quiet grounded space. And we don't, right? Today's world, most of us are running around doing all sorts of this and that before we, we, we tend to take action before we even think or, well, or and not think. <laughs> that there, that's where I get in trouble. And you brought up a really good point. If you get in that space of receiving, you've entered your sacred space. Mm. So your sacred space is where you study. Your sacred space is where you work. Your sacred needs to rise up and greet you. That means the space that you're operating really needs to fit your needs. Uh, One of the first things I work on with students is called executive functioning and it's organizational skills, study skills, and that kind of thing. You know, the simplest place to start, make your bed. Uh That tells your brain, (laughs) oh, I've got this. When you do that first thing in the morning, it just makes the rest of the day go better. And when you have a study space that fits the students' learning styles, the grades go up, their anxiety goes down. They're so much more relaxed because they have what they need right there. And it's usually really simple. It doesn't take very long to organize a student's space according so, to what they need. So everybody's different though, I would take it. Right, right. Um, but if you think about it, when you have a good chair, if it's got your back, you know, you've got your needs met before you start, you know, you're more productive. You're not having to jump up and get a bunch of things unless that's your learning styles. You need to jump up every five minutes and you do that. You get up and you go for it. But when you learn what your body needs, your body and your brain play nice and and they communicate well. It's like a good marriage where there's good communication instead of talking over each other or talking louder. The body and the brain have to be in harmony. Well, they don't have to, but in order to have better grades and have less stress, you get them balanced. You take care of the body before you ever do whatever that thing is that you're going to do. When you go into it mindless, that's when we're wasting really good quality time. You know, so so is it sort of like triggering your mind for that starting point? Like, yes, exactly. Exactly. And then the brain goes, oh, I know what he wants. He's not trying to kill me. Okay. (laughs) All right. Because a lot of times, you know, the body will just seize up and go, oh, no, 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 no. Or with ADD and ADHD and with dyslexia, if you're stressing the body more, the dyslexia gets louder, gets stronger, gets more powerful. You can help control dyslexia and you can help balance ADD and ADHD by getting the body happy first and learning to communicate. Okay, this is not working. You know, there's a check sheet. Okay, I'll try this. Or a simple example, let's say you're doing math and it's just not working. You flip over and do some reading, something in language arts, some history, you're using a different side of the brain. So you change, you give the brain a little break and then you go back to the math. You don't just try to hammer, hammer, hammer through if it's not working. The brain is saying, hey, look, I'm not gonna do this no matter what you do. So you're going, okay, brain, What if we, you're negotiating with a two-year-old is what you're doing, a cranky (laughs) two-year-old. And so what you do is, okay, let's go do this and take a break, doing the language arts, doing the reading, whatever you need to do. Or you take a timer, set a timer and you take a physical break because your body is saying, 
this is not working. Your body is always communicating. Are we listening? And are we responding kindly? So it's interesting. So I set up this podcast, you know, the, the last issue we, we talked with Jennifer and she was speaking about um, her training and, and how your body communicates to you. And so I'm, I'm set up talking to you about the mind and I'm finding out that uh, it's still both. It's exactly. Still, it's always and it's, both. And if it's only one, we're in trouble. And that's love, when we know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I love how you said, cause it's, I do talk about that in my book. I said, sometimes you walk into the painting studio and, and you're just, it's not working. It's okay. It's okay. And if it's not working, sometimes just walking away is the best thing you can do. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because when we're trying to force anything, it's not going to work, especially our creativity. Uh -huh. You know, if you're trying to get something down on the page, it's just not going to work. But when you're in that zone and that's what getting the body and brain together, that helps you get to the zone. So you know, when when my son came and he, you had him hug the tree, you were kind of reconnecting the body to the, to the brain. Yes, because he didn't want to be there. And I saw that when he was walking <laughs> toward me, my brain went, uh oh, I hadn't planned on hugging that tree. Um, I hadn't planned on him. What I wanted him to do is press his back to it. Um, and he did. But once he did that, I thought we're going to be okay because he was walking as if, why are we doing this? And who's that lady? And so it just, it just helps to take a minute to see, okay, now it's like really good communication. What is it that I need? And if you'll get quiet, your body will tell you. And, and I teach my students to do this and they hated it first. And they go, I know, I know, I know. You're going to ask me what I need. I don't know what I need. And I'm like, well, just sit with it, you know, and then something will, something will bubble up you know, something that's not working. Um, when we set up their study space, their desk or wherever they're working, I have them clear everything off first and bring things back one piece at a time. And I said, okay, is it motivating you or distracting you? And we do that with everything. And you'll be surprised how little they end up on their desk because they understand it's, it's a distraction. And then I have them um, get a black mat to put down on their desk, like a desk blotter because that tells the brain oh this is serious we're focusing it's like the artwork that you're sitting inside the mat it's framing the artwork so this is the the work that's been framing to we're going to do so this is not where we're sitting there pleasure reading we've got to focus and so the brain's like okay this is not pleasure reading okay i'm on it but i'm telling the brain what we're going to do but i'm also making sure the body understands that I'm working in harmony with it. And when I don't, it just doesn't work. It's, it's forcing and it's pushing and everybody has a tell. My shoulder will get a little weird. I'm pushing it. What's your tell? Do you know? I bet you do. I, I don't know. Uh, I okay. guess my partner would know. <laughs> All right. We'll have to, we'll have to you ask. You can watch me and see what my tell is, you know. I, All right, I'm made. Um, I noticed when with Blake, one shoulder goes up just a tiny bit. Wow. Just a tiny, tiny bit. And that's the beauty of Zoom um, because you can really zoom in on what they're doing. You can really watch the dynamics of what's going on in their face and their, their expressions. And it's just a lot of fun because their grades go up. So I can't believe this. So you're actually uh, focusing on when you, you know, Lisa, do you re realize how rare that is? I mean, how many educational consultants actually watch the body posture of the per of the student while they're teaching? I think just to be even aware of that is amazing. Well, they taught me, the students taught me that because I had a, a athlete tell me this. He goes, you know, I just can't pull anything over on you. And I'm like, no. He said, so you know what I'm lying? I was like, yeah. You know, and he said, well, how is it that, you know, and I said, well, I'm watching your body language. And he said, but teenage boys can fool anybody, but we can't fool you. I'm like, ah. Ah. you know, because sometimes they're fooling themselves because they want to look cool and they'll act yeah. like they understand something. And I can just tell that they don't. And then I call them on it and they're not happy with me, but we start to work through. Okay. 
your body's saying this. And then I tell them what I'm seeing. And what happens is they learn to be effective communicators with themselves. And then they can go out and be more effective communicators with everyone else. Because so you're sort of building a self-awareness to them. Yeah, it really is. And it starts with a lot of students. I get a lot of really smart students that have never had. And they either get to middle school, somewhere in high school or in college, and they hit a wall because they've always been able to do it without ever really having any techniques. When they tell you, no, you're right. I've never learned how to study. So then we get down and once I understand how they process, we start playing with different ideas. And so studying, test taking, it's a game. You have to give the educational system what they need, but you need to get the information in a way that you can take it in. So, so you can. Okay, so I will share that with our listeners. So how I reconnected with Lisa is my son is older now. He's uh, 16, 17, and he's taking his ACT tests. and. And so um, we reached out for Lisa to do some training. And so I was fascinated, Lisa, when I sat in and watched you with him. Um, she had him write, and it, correct me if I get this wrong, she had him write his name, Lisa had him write his name in three different color inks. She said, write it in blue, red, and black. And then she, I believe you covered him up and you slid the paper off and asked him where his eyes go. Like, what does he see mm -hmm. first? So how does that work? I mean, um, I was, I was teaching, um, I'm special ed certified K through 21. I also uh, am regular ed certified and I have a master's in education. And I had these kids that just could not learn certain things. And I knew they were brilliant. I knew it. I just knew it. But when standardized testing came out, I couldn't prove it. I could prove it on my test because if they were auditory, I'd have them come up and I'd read the question to them and they'd answer it auditorily. I couldn't do any of those things. And I'm like, okay, there's gotta be a different way. There's, I know how brilliant this child is. And so I started uh, studying color. Don't know why, um, but first I found the black background. I was teaching a reading program and if I put it down in a black background and they opened their book, it popped. Because, you know, this desk blotter, and I just had them use a piece of black construction paper. When you open a book, the work is framed. So if someone is ADD or dyslexic, it's like perfect. And so then we started playing with color. And I just started with colored construction paper and markers. And what I noticed was people were affected by color, which makes sense in oh, art. I'm an artist. I would think it oh, makes that, sense. Well, because, it's, it's, Exactly. But who, who takes that over into the learning arena? That is what's so wonderful, you know? Well, I appreciate that. But these kids were struggling and it was breaking my heart and I couldn't, I couldn't find anything. <clears throat> there was nothing. Else. I, for some reason, I started looking at color and the first thing I found out, well, that's why highlighters are yellow. Yellow goes into long-term memory before any other color. So we started putting their information on yellow note cards. I'm like, Oh, well, if a child is tactile, if the information they're trying to learn is on a yellow card, being tactile, holding it, is telling the brain, oh, I own this. Like, oh, okay, that works. And we're just trial and error. I had the biggest mess in my classroom you could have ever seen. Um, <laughs> and then we started working with different pen colors and things that worked with, like, some students didn't work at all. And I, and I would just be in tears. And I'd go home and I'm like, well, let's try this. And so I tried a different color. And then I could almost see in their eyes what color stimulated. You know, they'd write it down and they'd give me this look. And I'm like, oh, we got something. And so um, what I found was if you take your notes in the color that is stronger for you or the color that pops, it gets into long-term memory faster. Because you're not going down to get it. It's coming up it's pizza delivery instead of going into the restaurant. And then I'm like, Ooh, this is fun. And then the kids are seeing how brilliant they are, you know, just with these little bitty tweaks. And um, then we tried different highlighter colors. 
And supposedly it was supposed to always be yellow. Some people it wasn't. Oh. And I'm like, okay. Well, that's why sticky notes were yellow when they yeah. first came out, always because it, it the stimulation that it does. And I'm like, okay, but not for that person. Now, and you know, sometimes in education you think it's got to be everything for everybody. And back in those days, and I'm like, okay, so this person responds here and this person responds there. Um some people are very auditory, but it's only about 30% of the population. So those are the students in class that were always raising their hand that irritated the, the stew out of everybody else because the rest of us are still processing the information. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, so how do I give the rest of them a chance? So I'd, I'd figure out who was auditory and I would ask them because I knew they're going to raise their hands and I'd ask them just, okay, can you count to 60 and then you raise your hand and so to give everybody else some people need to process at a different speed and if they're speaking they get discombobulated and so i'm like watching these students trying to figure out how to make them feel successful with the standardized testing because it was it was devastating because you'd have a straight a student that just wasn't a good test taker you'd have an overachiever who didn't have good time management because they go through each question with such detail that they wouldn't get to the rest of it. You'd have learning different students that were never gonna to go to the next grade level because they couldn't pass that lovely test. And so I'm like, okay, so what do I know? Tests aren't fair. What can we do to make them fair? There's a way to make them fair if we understand how someone processes. So you understand what the test wants. You have to understand what you need to get that information into memory and then being able to pull it back out. And some students, when they do the colors and they do the notes and colors, they'll test, they'll close their eyes. They'll see the ink and the words just kind of come up on the page because they're visual. So here's you know? a question. Here's a question mm -hmm. for you, because I love this. Um, so what I'm getting from this is that we're all different. We're all exactly. different. We're, but I do think we're all intelligent and, and in different ways. Yes. <laughs> and so the, the key for anybody listening to this is to, uh, to, 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 to step back, watch yourself and see this, this being that I am. So um, I was teaching a behavior class this week and I, I tell the students that I like to talk in third person. And I'll say, Chris is, is grumpy today. And, and it, it, it allows me to step back from who I am mm -hmm. and go, why is Chris grumpy? Is it because his partner said this at, at breakfast time? You know, and it gives me that distance. And, and I think what I'd like to, to convey to the listeners to this is that we often, we have to step back from our mind and say, Okay, mind, how do you work? Or how do you work? Do you like colors? Do you like sounds? Do you like to move when you learn? And only when we distance ourselves and watch the watch our mind, and, and you're teaching us all these ways to do that. Like, is there a way that someone listening to this could could figure out very quickly? Am I visual? Am I audio? Am I kinesthetic? Do you have how do you figure that out with someone? Well, I think the simplest way is um Blake walks into and, and you say something from another room would he say I hear what you say or I see what you mean okay so that would tell us if he's auditory or if he's visual and then if you look at look around your room I'm assuming that color is important to you mm -hmm. so that tells me that you're visual and usually Along with that, you're tactile, which I know that because you paint. And that means small muscles, things you can touch, but it also means you need to relate to the people that you're working with. What that tells me is if the student is that way, they need to find a tutor that they can align with. They can't go in and just cold get the information. They have to have a heart to heart connection. And that's what's so important. With the work that I do, my job is to open up their heart first. I don't teach from the head, I go from the heart. And so once I find out what they need, we go from there. And you can pretty much tell if someone's really auditory um, by how much they talk. 
you know, and how quickly they can respond to things. And then you can tell if they're tactile, which once again is small muscles or kinesthetic, which is moving large muscles, are they athletic? You know, they do, they do a lot of things in that line that tells you they need to move. So if that's them, they probably need to move before they crack the book open, if they even have a book anymore. They probably need to go take care of the body and go shoot some hoops or do something and then go to work. Because what you can do is navigate and negotiate with your body and say, okay, body, we're going to go get some activity, have some fun, but then we got to sit down and study. And so you, you negotiate with your body instead of beating it up. The other thing I do with my students is I'll say, how long do you think you can study and really be on task? And they'll say 30 minutes. And I'll say, okay, let's make it 15. And they're like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Because what will happen is students will be there for hours and the parents think they're studying and they're staring at it, but they're not engaged with it. So I'll say, okay, we're going to set a timer for 15 minutes and let me know when you lose your edge. And then we back it off. So maybe they can study for eight minutes. And then take a two minute time break. Do you see what that does for the brain? The brain knows you're not trying to kill it. The brain go- knows in eight minutes, we're getting up, we're moving. And, and so you, it, you do little bites of things. Instead of cleaning up the whole kitchen, just unload the dishwasher. Don't go in there with the attitude as oh, I've got to clean up the whole kitchen. Because then the body and the brain are like, okay. I can do that. And then when the, sometimes I set the timer, I'm going to do this for five minutes because then it's no pressure. And then I, I can do more, you know, and the, the same is going with the body, you know, don't stress it out. Let's start with eight minutes or whatever and take a break. And then we move it to 10. Then we move it to 12, but don't sit down to try to study for two hours, especially if there's some learning differences. You know, some people can, can do that and it's very, very effective. Most students will sit there for the two hours, but what if you had studied for 30 minutes and it was really rich and productive mm-hmm. instead of the two hours? You know, that's, that's the difference. And when they start to learn their kind of body clock and their grades go up and they realize how smart they are, it's just so much fun. It's just, there's a lot of laughter. Well, as you've seen with Blake, there's a lot of, we've had a lot of laughter. Well, I I think that that's one of the things that that you've taught me too, is that it's important to help them establish confidence. And, and I think in our system, we try to make everybody conform to the same way. You know, you have to work this way and realizing this is for adults, every, everyone listening to this, how do I work? And it's okay. Am I better, like you said, am I better sitting down for three solid hours or am I better sitting down for 20 minutes, jumping up and doing something else, sitting down for 20 minutes, jumping up and doing something else, you know, giving your that break and to appreciate that we're all intelligent. Oh, yes. I remember. You just don't I got, do it the I, same way. I'm sorry. I remember, Lisa, I got in an argument with a guy years ago at a Christmas party and he was one of these guys that got straight A's and he insisted that certain people were more intelligent than others. And I said, no, I think people are intelligent in, in a different way. Some people Uh are intelligent kinesthetically. Some people are intelligent audially. Some people are verbal, you know, but we all have different intelligences. And I think it's, I think it's a disservice for us to say, oh, this thing is intelligent. This person's not. We just haven't, we don't see their intelligence. We're not taking the time to see that unique intelligence. You are though, you, you're sitting down and you're looking at these people and you're going, oh, it, it, you just need to see it in color or, oh, you need to see it in word. Well, and it's, it's fun because once you, they already know what works, but they need the validation. And I can tell them why, because they think they're different. They're not, they're these geniuses. Um, mm-hmm. And it's so much fun when you give them permission to do things differently. Because let them do it differently when they're at home studying. Let them do it differently in the classroom. If it's not bothering anybody, allow them to be who they need to be so they can soar. And it's just um, a hoot. Uh, An example is I worked with a, a daughter and we finished and the mom said, would you work with me? And I'm like, you know, sure. 
and we had done executive functioning for the daughter and gotten her her um, study space organized. And I said, okay, send me some pictures of your office and then I'll mark them up in notability and I'll tell you how to move things around because I had worked with the mom enough that I knew what she needed. And she had this big office and I almost cried because it didn't support her. There was nothing of her in there. It was sad. And so I'm, I'm looking at these pictures and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she's got this big office, but it doesn't have her back. She's got a big office. She doesn't have her, her seat, her space, nothing, nothing is working. And so I get these in notability and then you can just draw an arrow and you run, move things around. Now I just do this on zoom. You know, they're just, we're just doing their, <laughs> the camera around and we move things around. And so I started mocking things up and then I would get stuck because there were, there were some things that weren't working. And I'm like, well, if I'm stuck, imagine how she feels. Right. So she moved everything around. She set it up to where it was, it was grace under fire because she had a really high profile, stressful job. But when you walked in there, she was in the seat of her power. And my husband said something to me years ago, I was going to get a, um, an inexpensive chair from Sam's because I had a gift card. And he <laughs> said, no, 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 no. When people walk into your office, your chair needs to be a seat of your power. And it says I'm in charge. And I'm like, whoa. Well, see, nothing in her office said she was in charge. And after she had made those changes, it was phenomenal. It was just phenomenal because your office or your study space is the best executive assistant you will ever have. It needs to greet you when you walk in. And so we did that. And the same thing with the kids. And then they're like, oh, because, you know, we're doing school at home. So kids are moving from room to room. And I'm like, well, let's get you a space that's mm. yours. Even if you've got to pack it up in a bag when you move it to the next room, because they're, maybe they're sharing the same desk or whatever. And they're like, I didn't know how important this was. But it's telling your brain, you know, you are important. Body, you are important. Back, you want to be supported. And lighting, lighting is really important. If you have dyslexia, if you have ADD, if you have ADHD, lighting is a game changer. Um, usually direct lighting is not as beneficial as indirect, especially with dyslexia, because if the light is too bright, the words dance on the page, almost like they're underwater and glistening. So it needs to be off to the side. Some people do better with a light, a task light at, on the left. Some do better at the right. So you put it there. Okay, look at the paper. All right, you move it over there. And so everything is like, body, I'm supporting you. Telling your body, what do you need? Don't you like it if someone says, what do you need? What do you need this morning? Sometimes I panic because I don't know what I need. And I've got to <laughs> stop a minute and go, oh, you know, what do I need? That's great. So, so you're focused a lot on environment. You're saying that your environment does matter in, in learning how you, way you process information. I, I noticed with my son, um, and I think this is valid for all of us, uh, you were having him work through his ACT testing. And so I'm going to share this and then you can correct me. How's that? I'll share <laughs> this with the listeners. So we would look at a page of, of the ACT test. It's, a, it's a, a sample from an old test. And you immediately showed him how to almost take ownership of that page. Like he starts dividing the page and, and matching chart to chart, sort of like declaring, this is, my, this is my space and this is how it, is that right? Tell me. Exactly. Because if you're looking at a clean page, the page owns you. Think about it. And once you put pen to paper, because he's tactile uh -huh. and because he's visual, that works for him. And the kids call it tagging the page, you know, because they could literally tag the page. And <laughs> what happens is the brain goes, oh, oh, I know something about this. Once you put your pen to paper on that test, you're, you're giving some ownership. So 
let's say your name Christopher. Let's pretend someone can't spell Christopher. You don't have to start with the CH. If you realize that the name, that top is in there, you just write T-O-P and you start to build the word. Or if you look at the other word, Chris, and then you spell the word top, and then you spell the word her. You don't have to have the whole thing. The brain needs to see something. So when you put pen to paper, you're telling the brain, oh, we got this. And it's just like spelling a word that you don't know. You probably know something of it. Uh -huh. So you, you put down something and then there's a kickstart. There's this. The brain's like, oh, okay. I know what we're looking for. The same thing when he was marking up the page for those tests. One of the things they're testing is to see, can you take all this information and only figure out the little part that you need? So they're giving you way too much information to see if you have the ability to extrapolate out what you need. And that's why we were marking it up and blocking it. So that the brain is seeing parts when you've got so much information on the page, when you're visual, like he is, uh -huh. it's an overload. And so the way we were blocking things on the page, we could see parts instead of seeing the whole page. Cause the, the whole page is just like the brain's like, uh, I want a nap. But when you, when you find a way to layer it, it just simplifies. You know, it's like exercising. You can't do it all at once. It helps if you kind of warm up the muscles a little bit, uh -huh. just, you know, and that's what we're doing, warming up the brain. And, and that's why we were doing the tapping with the fingers. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so to explain this to the listeners, it's hard to describe, but go ahead. Um, well, EFT, which is emotional freedom technique, does a tapping technique all through the body but you can't do that in the classroom. So all it is, is just touching your uh, thumb to each finger nice and slowly and just breathing and pushing the air of the belly out. Because as you know, as a yoga student, when you change your breathing, everything changes. And when we get nervous, we hold our breath. That's right. the first thing we do. So when you push the belly out, whatever's been going on in the body, <sighs> it's going to release. And then, what will happen is with ADD and ADHD, the right and left hemispheres of the brain balance. And that's when the communication starts. That's why this is so important for anybody to do. Just thumb to each finger nice and slowly. You don't have to do a lot of speed. But if you if you just do this for a minute, you'll feel a shift, I expect, right now. Oh, yeah, it's a calming. Um, oh, it really, yeah, it really is. And so with students during a test, They'll, I have them put their hands on their desk and, and then later they'll go, I know who tutored you. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and they'll, or they'll say, Miss Lisa, I met one of your students. I'm like, well, who? And then we're figuring out. So anything that you can do. And, and you know, we did the PVC uh, pipe roller for um, Blake, just a piece of PVC pipe, about 11 inches long, two and, and uh, three eighths yeah. wide, shoes off, socks off, and you just roll the bottom of your feet. That does the same thing the tapping does. Some kind of activity like that to balance, to balance out the body. And what happens is you can lob information in faster and they retrieve it faster and they hold on to it. But if you haven't done those things, it's going to take longer. So why not take a few minutes, do a few activities before you start? Because the brain's going, okay, we got this. And then the body's going, okay. And then they can communicate. So this, so so much of this is about um, different ways to meditate or ground yourself before approaching. It's almost like all this is pre-work. It, it, it exactly is because the time that will save you is a game changer. It's because it's like you've gone in and you are focused and you, you don't even know what you're going to do yet, but you, you're on it. You don't spend those five, 10 minutes trying to figure out what to do. Your body and brain have figured it out while you were spending those few minutes and so then you learn okay i'm working on this um history it's not working you know to put it up oh and by the way don't have a stack of books in front of you only have in front of you what you're working on so so when you were talking about going into that woman's office you said it was very busy and and crowded 
So it's important that whatever workspace we're in, it, is it is it compartmentalized? Is that what you would say? Or it's got to fit what you need. Uh -huh. It's got to. It's like your learning styles. What does it need to look like? What I've learned is if, if you figure out a template for how their brain processes, and that's what we're doing with Blake. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what they throw at you. You've got your template for success. And I've said this many times, everybody's a genius. Everybody does something incredibly well. And I truly, in my heart, believe everybody can learn. I, I agree with you. I do think everybody is a genius and, and that we all communicate in different ways. And, and, and part of that, as, from a spiritual artist perspective, is recognizing that you do have that. And whether or not society has told you or helped you find it, it's, it's, it's our task to find it in ourselves, you know? Exactly. So if exactly. someone, let me ask you, if someone doesn't have a, a, a Lisa uh, at Watford in her life uh, or his life, how, how would, how would, what would you recommend for them to, to a first step toward this, to, to well, learning how their mind works? And I think it's what you said is go to third person. That was a great idea. Uh, and just kind of watch yourself from third person, you know, like, okay, why am I doing it like this? Why does this, why is this working? You know, if we're doing things that are working for us, there's got to be a reason, yeah. you know, okay. And then if it's not working, okay, what's, what is it about this? Um, my husband was taking a really important phone call and in my brain, I thought he's going to be up and moving in a moment because it was a really um, serious phone call. And it was like, and I'm watching him because I, and, it, and when he was walking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then he stopped <laughs> and I knew he had the answer. You know, because that's how he was processed. He was processing it, processing it through his body. And that's the thing is we process everything through our body. This is, this is totally my opinion. Uh -huh. I think all learning differences are stuck in the body. And as we tap and as we move and as we find like yoga and things that work, I think we help to release those. I, I really, um, that's one of the reasons I find tapping so healing because somewhere we've got that sort of stuck energy or stuck feeling. Mm -hmm. And once you're, you're tapping, it's able to move on through. That's why rolling the feet. That's why tapping the fingers. That's why you're moving because when you're moving, you're processing, I mean, processing, processing, processing at Definitely. a high rate of speed. Definitely. And let's say a student sitting in their desk and they're just moving back and forth, moving back and forth, moving back and forth as you're taking a test. If I go over and ask them to stop, the brain's going to go, do you want me working? I can stop moving, but I'm going to stop processing. I remember you teaching me that back when Blake was younger, that, um, that the problem with our school system is they think you're only learning if you're looking straight into someone's eyes and if you're sitting still. And, you know, they have those uh, balls now, like I think you recommended mm -hmm. them, like to right. sit on a ball and roll. And that would be me. I, I, I like my chair rolls. And I need to move around, you know. Well, every chair of someone studying or in the office needs to be on rollers. Sorry. Oh, really? That's, yes. I'm sorry, but it, it really doesn't. You need to be able to move because you need to be able to work your hips. You need to, be able to work your shoulders. You need to be able to flex around. Um, when we first were in COVID, my back was really hurting me. And what I realized was I have a really nice chair at the office, as you heard earlier, <laughs> and I was working from the dining room chair and I, I couldn't move. You know, it wasn't on uh, casters. And as soon as I got a rolling chair in there, I was fine because you need to be able, anybody, one that's not kinesthetic needs to be able to support their body. And when I'd move up, well, the chair didn't go with me. And so immediately I was fine. And it was because here I am telling everybody else they need to set their space up to work for them. I didn't do it for my chair. And it just makes a huge difference because it's, it's emotional support. It's physical support. And for you and for me, you know, having a comfortable chair. I want to share one last thing that I love that you, uh, that, that you remind me of. And I share all the time. I was out yesterday, as I told you, at a festival when I ran into a woman and she was talking about her son who had ADHD and and I said, you should give him gum. <laughs> I did. And she goes, what? I said, let him chew gum. And she had never heard that. And, and you're the one that ran that by me is that when a child chews gum, it helps sometimes for ADHD, it helps their mind. 
Oh yeah. Okay. It's that it's kind of like doing the tapping. You know, it's it's giving it's giving balance, kind of relaxing everything that's going on around them. They need some element of control. Give them something that they can do that will give them harmony in their bodies. Right. You know, and, and then it, peppermint. If they need to study, make sure it's mint because mint um, really stimulates the brain. You know, a little peppermint. Like I've got peppermint oil in my water, just a tiny bit of peppermint oil in my water, uh, just because it keeps me alert. <laughs> the things you've learned are endless. Lisa. <laughs> well, it's just because I love those kids and I don't like seeing them suffer. I just don't like seeing them suffer. I know? agree. And I, I try, I focus on the kid and everybody because we all have a little kid inside of us that, that we needs need. to be heard. Well, I thank you for sharing these wonderful ideas on, on the show. Um, and I look forward to uh, your continuing with Blake on his, his learning adventures. Um, is there any last thing you'd like to share that I haven't done? I think just be kind to yourself and listen to your body. Your body will tell you what it needs. You know, if you just take that quiet time to figure out what that looks like, that's, I believe, is what the game changing piece of all this is. Because once again, we are all brilliant. We are all brilliant. I, yes. I agree. And it's finding your brilliance. Find, it's there. It's there. Yes. It, yes. Everybody has it. Well, thank you. I, thank I, you. I, I appreciate it. It was a great interview. Talk to you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Whether you're following the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, make sure you choose the subscribe button so you'll receive new segments when they're released. Plus, check out my new book, The Spiritual Artist, now available on Amazon.com. In the meantime, be still, listen, and know that you are a spiritual artist.